Um, all right, um, we're going to get started now. Um, so welcome to our webinar, Leveraging Digital Platforms for Advocacy. Um, I wanted to start off with a round of introductions um, from myself and uh, the other two co-facilitators, Robert and Laura. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, but I think I recognize almost everyone's face here. Um, my name is Carlos Rosales. I'm the Community Outreach and Engagement Associate here at CCC. Um, and I'll pass it off to Laura. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Jangstrom, and I'm the Director of our Civic Engagement Programs at CCC. It's so great to see you all. And Robert? Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Gutterson, Communications Associate at CCC. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so welcome all uh, to our workshop today. Um, as you already know or are familiar with, uh, digital advocacy has been at the forefront of uh, many advocates and many organizations work, especially uh, in light of the emergence of the pandemic. We've come to rely on a lot of uh, the tools we're utilizing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, more frequently. Um, so we decided, you know, as an organization to kind of share a little bit of what we know and some of the experience and expertise that we have, but also create um, a space where, uh, you know, other colleagues and advocates can also chime in, chime in and share uh, a little bit about um, the insights they also have um, when it comes to advocacy uh, in the digital landscape. Um, so during this workshop, you know, we want to go through the different elements of digital advocacy, including um, strategies, um, some of the ways to measure success, um, some of the free and user-friendly online tools uh, and steps to take for really effectively involving and engaging um, policymakers, stakeholders, uh, and even also community members uh, in our work as we continue to kind of deepen our connection um, to the uh, to use to utilizing all of these tools. Um, so a little bit about um, just us as an organization. Um, you know, we've just recently celebrated our 75th anniversary um, with our efforts focusing on engaging and mobilizing New Yorkers to make a better place for uh, uh, New York City children and families. Uh, with our mission being to ensure that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Uh, and a lot of that work, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, revolve around uh, a, a really robust roster of civic engagement programming and activities. Um, we have a lot of research and data resources that many of you and other colleagues and stakeholders utilize that focus on child and family well-being. Typically, that information has been available at the city level, um, but this past year especially, we've begun um, increasing our reach so that way um, research and data is also made available at, um, at the state level too. Um, so there's some um, new uh, products that just got released and hopefully in the future continue to be released um, that also uh, can serve as a resource for some of our colleagues that um, uh, work or provide support for families upstate. Uh, and then a lot of, you know, what, what this conversation is also going to be tying into today is the advocacy and policy efforts that exist, um, you know, for CCC that has typically been uh, from uh, an analysis level of the budget and legislative pro uh, proposals that emerge from city, state, and federal levels. I know you definitely receive, many of you have received a lot of communication from us in that regard. Uh, and then we also, you know, have coalitions uh, knowing that, you know, we can't just do this work alone. Uh, we need to work with other partners, um, such as the Raise uh, the Age uh, uh, New York campaign, Campaign for Children, uh, the Family Homelessness Coalition, and other uh, coalitions that we work with on various advocacy and issue areas um, for the well-being of children and families. Um, all ultimately, I think, to advance policies that, um, that support the families and the communities that we are serving. Um, so when we talk about digital advocacy, you know, as you all are aware, um, there are many elements of advocacy that are going to be tied into the conversation that we have today and the resources that we share. Uh, we'll be sharing with you, you know, different tips and resources, but also approaches from 
making connections to building relationships, uh, you know, ensuring that um, folks and, and your network that you engage with are developing advocacy skills so that they, they can apply and either participate in your own efforts uh, or advocate on issues that matter to them. Um, we know that uh, advocacy also involves um, understanding the issue and making sure that um, that the people who are experiencing it, whether it be communities or particular stakeholder groups are centered um, because they are the most directly impacted by the issue. Um, all to then move forward into the stages of advocacy that involve mobilizing action and then ultimately influencing and creating change uh, on those advocacy areas. So a lot of what you're going to hear from us today are going to be pulling or, or tie into all of these different elements of advocacy. Um, oh. So in this first part um, that I'll be starting with you all today, uh, I'm going to be focusing a little bit of the conversation on um, digital advocacy strategies, really centering on how do we plan. Um, now, uh, for anyone who's going to be in uh, the breakout group with me, I'll be going into a lot more uh, of these questions uh, and these strategy uh, approaches more in our breakout group. So um, I, for now, I'll, I'll just be kind of giving a big picture highlight of some of these elements. But I do wanna make sure that for anyone who is uh, joining us today, feel free, you have control over uh, your mic. Uh, so pause uh, and ask us a question if you have any during this presentation. There'll definitely be time in the breakout groups to um, kind of go and explore some of these issues more, but we're also happy to answer questions as we go over through um, these big picture highlights right here. Um, so going back to um, this focus on developing a digital advocacy strategy and thinking about how do we make plans, um, I want to share kind of an overview of what we see kind of the core elements uh, and approaches are as it pertains to digital advocacy. Um, first, uh, in thinking oh, sorry, about- Sorry, Latoya is raising her hand. Yes, Latoya, yeah. you can mute yourself. Hi, yes, I would like to know are these slides gonna be emailed to us because I can't you know, write down these notes as fast as you're providing them. Absolutely, the slides are going to be uh, emailed to you and then there's going to be a link that I'll be sharing in a few moments as we get towards uh, the breakout group sessions that also has uh, links and resources to some of the items that you're going to be seeing here. Uh, and then if there's, you feel like there's anything missed when you go into the breakout groups, uh, don't hesitate to ask the facilitator uh, if, you're try if you're missing something or if you're having trouble opening one of the links, for example. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so um, both in this initial presentation in the breakout groups, um, we're gonna be focusing on a few of the um, elements uh, when it pertains to digital advocacy uh, and some of um, both, I think, unique challenges as well as approaches one can take and, and maybe some of the elements that one should be thinking about. Um, first, it, uh, and it will pertain to what is essentially the structure um, uh, and in, in the digital landscape that is the place where you're going to have uh, an online or a central hub um, that your constituents or advocates are going to be uh, focusing on. Typically that tends to be website, either a website, uh, if you are at an organization uh, or you're with a group that already has one. If not, that can also be social media pages, YouTube channels, uh, or even a, a blog um, that is kind of that centralized space um, where the advocacy uh, and engagement is happening. Uh, second, um, We'll also be talking about um, elements regarding connecting with supporters, and that particularly is around communication tools um, that we use right now, especially um, from email lists, social media, social media uh, network platforms, text messaging, and other traditional media uh, tools that we use. Uh, and then um, focusing on the elements of relationship building, mobilization, and action through online engagement ensuring that we are connecting with potential supporters, we have um, the ability to influence the online discussion uh, in your own space or even in other spaces that you might be a part of, media relations, 
relations, a social networking outreach, email discussions, online advertising, uh, and other elements like podcasts, videos, and live stream uh, events, all that contribute to uh, the different types of engagement you hope to have to advance your advocacy work. Um, so before I kind of go into some of those key elements a little more closely, I wanted to ask a question um, from everyone in the room here, uh, and you can use the chat to type in your response or answer out loud. Uh, but the question is essentially, what challenges have you encountered with, uh, while advocating uh, in this digital landscape? Um, so I'll give everyone uh, a few moments, but feel free to type in the chat. Okay, so Kalima says uh, the learning curve of constituents, sufficient time to do it well, yes, linking materials to messages on Twitter, uh, summarizing the issue, of course. Great, so keep on, those are all the excellent um, points and challenges that you've raised. Yes, difficulty reaching non-English speakers, identifying the channels where we can reach both. So yeah, um, and ever-changing uh, platform to tools. Yes, I think all of this uh, in one way or another is actually going to be raised uh, in some part in this first part of the conversation. Uh, and of course, I think most of you signed up to breakout groups um, that will go deeper into some of these questions. So if you feel like we haven't raised a particular challenge or responded to one of these uh, concerns that you raised in terms of using um, digital platforms, please um, don't forget to stop us and ask us questions. Um, so I think one of the first things that I've seen um, in the responses uh, you just raised relate to one of the key components of any digital advocacy strategy, which is to educate and mobilize your group around the issue area that you're working for. Um, so in when we go into, uh, for those participating in the, not only uh, the breakout group around digital advocacy strategies, but the other two groups, you'll definitely be hearing insights on what are the different activities you can engage to digitally inform and mobilize the public about your advocacy issues, and there are many. You know, newsletters, of course, uh, are, are one of the uh, top ones. One pagers and infographics, they take a little bit more time to create, uh, but again, are very helpful in informing uh, uh, your constituency or uh, being able to mobilize your group around the issue. When it comes to social media, particularly using it in terms of its ability to uh, create awareness building, engage in storytelling and mobilization, um, is, has, is really helpful. And then public forums, community events, PSAs, rallies, uh, and other types of events that serve this purpose. All of these are definitely achievable uh, in the digital uh, landscape, uh, and you'll be seeing some examples of that. Uh, and I think the other part of this is as you begin the process of engaging uh, and mobilizing this group, I think the question of, you know, from that point, how do you then move forward uh, with building strong partnerships uh, online? The second part that I think that you're going to be seeing uh, during this conversation and in the further discussions is communicating your advocacy message. So um, before we could get into developing, I think what that might specifically look like for you or kind of workshop those, having an understanding of how you currently advocate um, and how is that advocacy work getting communicated, whether it be from newsletters, listservs, or other methods. Um, the second is uh, what kind of communications are most important to you and your audience groups. Uh, and now I think a lot of people realize here that, you know, it's not only information that people are seeking, but sometimes that is also can include good services uh, and other resources that they need. Uh, some, uh, of your audience members might be looking to participate in action, whether it be uh, sending emails to their legislators, uh, participating in petitions, signing on to statements, and even voting and participating in protests uh, when they can do it safely. Uh, and then events that provide other types of learning and skill building opportunities um, that we'll be sharing with you here. 
Uh, and then the last two questions I think that are key um, to getting answers to and developing your strategy is, you know, how frequently does your audience receive communications and having an understanding of that? Uh, and then how do you communicate outside of your membership or outside of your advocacy network? So that way um, your groups continue to grow. Um, and then third, you know, similar to the previous uh, one, the goal of influencing change, um, that strategic question essentially revolves around how you can use your unique voice to influence policymakers and the general public. Now, we know that there are many more than one ways to influence change, and it's all about, um, you know, making sure that that approach is reflective of uh, your audience and the constituent group you are working with, the capacity that you have, whether uh, as a single advocate or as an organization, um, some and, and the partnerships that you develop that can lend itself to any of these um, action items here that can influence change. Uh, and both Laura, Robert, and myself in the breakout groups will be kind of showing uh, and speaking to more about these some of these different elements uh, in them as well. Uh, and then lastly, um, to uh, kind of wrap up this section of uh, key components um, to co consider is that, you know, persistence is going to be needed and you're going to be seeing uh, in this discussion how uh, we can be persistent uh, and how um, constant engagement might be necessary to make sure that policy or advocacy, uh, your advocacy approach um, leads to some type of policy change, recognizing that it doesn't always happen immediately, um, but the process uh, can sometimes be lengthy, but ultimately rewarding. And I think there's going to be case examples where we can highlight some of um, those successes um, that we've achieved uh, even most recently. Um, and then lastly, tied to this, uh, but really because of the fact that um, change does not happen immediately, thinking about the element of a timeline for when you hope to achieve uh, both activities in the short term and the long term. Um, and then lastly, before I, I transition off to Robert, um, is to kind of give a reminder for anyone who is new to uh, engaging in advocacy to ensure that you already have a clear advocacy goal and mission. That's going to really help influence the type of uh, digital advocacy strategies you take. Uh, here I provide with everyone a definition of what a mission and goal is, um, but really answering the questions of why are you coming together? What are you hoping to achieve in the short and the long term? And what you can, can you achieve that others can't? Um, so now I'll hand it off to Robert, who's going to be speaking, providing an overview of um, the creative portion uh, when it comes to uh, digital advocacy strategies. Right. Thanks, Carlos, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Robert Gutterson, Communications Associate at CCC. Um, I manage or create most of the digital and print content for CCC, um, including our website. Um, so I, as you can tell, uh, uh, just from the amount of things I have to oversee, time is always an issue for, for us, especially at small nonprofits. So I completely relate to somebody, the person who said that uh, creating this content in a timely way is always a challenge. Um, and that's, that's why uh, you know, we kind of work together to the learn um, best ways to optimize our time. Um, so in this, in this section, um, I'm gonna be going over the various creation strategies that we use at CCC to optimize the user experience. Um, and when I say that, I mean um, getting the attention of the user and then creating paths of least resistance to conversion. In other words, uh, how, can we, how can we remove as many steps slash barriers as possible for a user to take some sort of action? Um, for example, let's say you have a petition you want people to sign onto you. What are the most efficient ways to grab people's attention and get them to your site to actually sign the petition? Uh, go ahead, next slide. Okay, so we're going to go over social media. I'm sure everybody is on at least one platform here. Um, social media is uh, a great way to introduce your organization to new users. Um, everyone knows these platforms use algorithms to serve out uh, ads to you. 
Um, however, the organizations can also use the algorithm, algorithm the uh, platform's algorithm to reach out to or connect with um, new followers. Um, so no longer are the days of counting followers for your, your organization um, important. Now it's all about trying to uh, get into the algorithm um, and, and get into someone else's feed based on the fact they might be interested in your content. Um, that's done through various means, but most likely you're going to be using hashtags on your on your uh, your tweets um, and uh, just also just other methods to get that it, that content in their feed. Um, and then we also use advocacy platforms. And what I mean by that is an emailing system. We use Salsa, uh, Salsa Labs, Salsa Engage. Um, there's other tools that we'll go over to that are more affordable or free. Um, these can also be a petitioning system, um, a social media aggregation tool. Um, their main purpose is to keep you connected uh, with your, adv your advocacy base after making some sort of initial contact. Um, these platforms can be used to connect your advocacy base also with um, offices of elected officials. And then last on this slide, uh, you need to use compelling visuals to stop users from scrolling um, and read your posts. That's what I mean by incorporating scroll stopping share graphics and images. Um, we'll go over this a little bit more in our case studies um, and also in my breakout group where we'll actually develop a uh, strategy um, based on a older take action that um, CCC had um, last year um, and develop a strategy based on that take action. And uh, if we have time, create um, a couple of share graphics um, that, uh, that we'll discuss and go over. Um, and lastly, um, your central hub, uh, more than likely all these, the steps on the previous slide are gonna try, you're gonna try to get people to your website to do something. And so all the work you put into uh, slide 14 um, or the previous slide can be for naught if, um, if the user experience on the website uh, doesn't work out. So what do we mean by optimizing user experience on your website? Um, most users for one want your website to be usable in three seconds. So not necessarily that your site will load in three seconds, but that you can start, that you can start to like scroll up and down within three seconds um, or uh, numbers show they tend to leave after that. Uh, another thing to keep in mind um, is social media uh, when it comes to download speed. Um, if a user it sees your link on Twitter, goes to your website and gives up because your site isn't loading or maybe it's not optimized for mobile, they go back to Twitter. Twitter assumes um, that they're not that they're not interested in your content and will start to remove your content from their feed. Uh, so there's something to think about. Um, and there's a couple of tools, a couple of things you can do as a non-developer to kind of increase the speed of your of a page. Um, one, avoid using photo files, uh, PNG or JPEGs, um, whenever possible. If you can do something graphically, just using um, uh, you know, some kind of coding method or using like if you have Squarespace, you can use Squarespace, um, then use that instead. If you have control over, uh, here's a bit of jargon, CSS or HTML or site, go that route rather than uh, defining, making a graphic with a PNG or JPEG. Um, if you have photos, make sure the photos um, you're using are compressed or you're using a system that compresses it for you. A lot of uh, WordPress, Squarespace, they take, take care of compression. Um, for you, but if you're uploading it and linking directly to a photo, make sure you are you're you're not um, uh, overloading the browser by uh, you know having three megabyte photos um, in there. And that this also holds true for your emails too. Um, you want to make sure you're compressing your emails, or else uh, one email providers might block your email. Two, um, if it takes a long time for your photo to download, a user might give up and uh, leave your email without engaging. Um, so on the screen or on this slide here, I have um, a couple of images. Um, first on the left is Google Lighthouse. That is uh, a great tool to use just to, to get an overall speed of your site or various pages. Um, it will tell you how fast it takes to, to until the user can actually use it. Um, and will also give you a comparison based on um, different uh, network speeds. And on the right hand side, this um, this is actually in the, this comes with every browser. I prefer to use this tool in Mozilla Firefox. I know that's a browser from uh, years ago that no one uses, but it's a great, it's, it, it does some great things. And this is one of them. It actually will, uh, if you go and right click on the browser and go to inspector tools, this is gonna show you every single thing that is gonna be downloaded onto your site. 
Um, you can test it on uh, Wi-Fi. You can test it on 3G, 4G, uh, um, 5G, just to test out how long it takes um, for all these things to download and gives you an idea of what some of the files are that are taking a bit longer. Okay, um, another important step too in, in, uh, in uh, optimizing the user experience is making sure your website is responsive to mobile devices. So that means your site should scale properly when someone goes to it, should be easy to use, uh, fonts should be readable, um, and it should restack itself properly um, when visited by a mobile user. Um, everyone knows uh, most people visit sites now by my mobile. It's, it's uh, truly uh, important that they have a good experience um, or else they will leave your site. Um, and also accessible, accessibility. Uh, what does that mean? Um, first, easy for people to, with disabilities to use. That means using um, alt tags, alt attributes in your images, in your important images. So that way, they're, uh, if, they have a, if they have a sight impairment, they can, or vision impairment, they can, um, uh, the, the, the browser will read to them what the image uh, is about. Um, use proper HTML tags. So buttons should be buttons. Don't use images in places uh, in place of buttons. Um, and colors should be high contrast. So again, not to plug Firefox, I don't work for Firefox, but Firefox has a great accessibility tool that will tell you um, where some of these issues are uh, when it comes to accessibility. And then obviously uh, accessibility is also um, making sure that some of your important content is, is translated. Um, there's uh, free plugins such as Google Translate that can take others for you if you don't have someone on staff to translate some of your important, your more important pages. Okay, next slide. And quantifying uh, and measuring success. Um, so there's a lot of different things we look at here. Um, we, for social media, you have uh, reach and engagement. Again, um, followers um, and page likes aren't as important anymore. It's all about uh, making sure that, you know, these social media platforms wanna make sure the users have good experiences when they come to their site. So they wanna put content they think they'll like in front of them. That's that dreaded algorithm that we all know about. Uh, but use that to your advantage. See if people, check out the reach. Uh, reach is how many people you are, are actually seeing your post. Engagement is essentially, are they engaging with it in some way? Are they clicking on a link? Are they liking it? Are they retweeting it, sharing it, whatever? That's engagement. Um, number, uh, next one is number of supporters who participate in the advocacy campaign. Um, uh, where, you, you know, did you have 100 supporters write emails to uh, elected officials? Is that what you're hoping for? Uh, and so on. Um, and then the outcome of the advocacy campaign. So was there a measure you were trying to have passed um, or included in the budget? Um, did it make it in? That's just another measure of success. Um, Emails, you want to watch for open rates and click rates. Open rates is they opened your email. Click rates is they clicked through to uh, hopefully your website. Um, you want to make sure uh, that you aren't including link. If you're trying to get people to their site, to your site to take action, don't include a bunch of links elsewhere. Just have them go to your site. Um, and uh, you want to watch for user retention and unsubscribes. And then lastly, on your website, um, uh, this is getting a little bit more of uh, the marketing territory instead of the advocacy ter territory. But if you want to have people coming to your site, taking some sort of action and maybe roaming around the rest of your pages to learn a little bit more about you and your campaign, you want to watch for bounce rate. Bounce rate is they come in, they might take action, um, but then they leave right away. They're not going anywhere else. That is also, that's going to be a hit on social media again, because that means they're coming in, doing something, and then coming right back to social media or they're quitting. So that's, that will be a hit on social media. It's also just not good for your site. You want more sessions. Um, um, as we mentioned here, we want more pages per session and session duration. So pages per session, how many pages are they visiting when they're visiting your site? Session duration, how long are they spending on your site? Um, so that's just something to consider. Um, it, the, the, the goals, is it depends on your organization and what your mission is. It, it, it's different for every single person or every single organization. Um, so I would suggest just doing some research on peer organizations um, and comparing the numbers. And, uh, and lastly, remind yourself uh, what was the goal of the campaign. Throughout this whole thing, when you're, when you're doing some kind of actor action review, what was the goal? 
Um, and just remember, if your numbers aren't what you expected, if they're lower than what you thought, don't take that as a punishment. Um, use them to learn. Uh, try to determine where your numbers are falling through. You know, um, if you have a lot, so for example, if you have um, a lot of people clicking through on your emails, right, but then you have a high bounce rate on your website and they're only spent, and session durations are really short, it's probably that your website is loading slowly and they are just giving up. Um, so try to find out, like try to track, uh, you can't really track users from website to email, but try to figure out like why are our click rates um, high, but then as soon as they get to our site, they're leaving. It could be an issue with your, how slowly your uh, uh, website loads. Um, and then with emails, um, another send it, send it different times, adjust your subject lines. Just, just try to constantly, this is a, a constantly evolving thing, this digital realm um, of advocacy and marketing. And just, uh, you know, for example, with us, we, we, had, we were consistently sending out emails in the afternoons because that was when our open rates are highest. And then when around when COVID first, uh, pandemics were started, we noticed that our opening rates when we sent out emails in the morning were actually higher. And then we had to readjust again in the last few months and start saying them again in the afternoons. Um, so just constantly be uh, maybe once a month, look at your numbers. Don't do them every single day because that will drive you crazy. Once a month, look through all your numbers and make and make sure they're, they're still uh, where you want them to be. If not, then readjust. Uh, next one. Okay, so now we have a section on digital advocacy tools when on a budget. I'm assuming we're all smaller nonprofits. Um, and depending on you know how much money is given to your, your team, uh, the communications team, or wh whoever is responsible for social media um, design or digital advocacy or, and outreach, um, you, you might have differing budgets. So I wanted to provide some affordable um, options here. So starting out in design, um, I know Adobe Creative Cloud, that sounds like, oh, that's, that's like the premier one that everyone uses. It's actually only about $60 a month. Um, for and you get access to every single every single program that they make. That's Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator. The the so so it does cost money, and there is a significant learning curve. But if you give this some time, you can make some really great um, share graphics, some great images uh, with with these tools. Below that, we have Canva, uh, free with a paid option. It's easy. It's a much smaller learning curve than um, say InDesign, which is an Adobe tool. Um, easier user interface. Um, and the paid option um, uh, actually has uh, this great uh, uh, option to hold all of your, your branding uh, parameters and materials uh, on site. So you can have all your, your, your branding colors. You can have um, other content in there, there uh, your fonts that you use, um, and just uh, store them in, in uh, Canva. So it's really convenient. Um, and lastly, in the, in the design section, I have this uh, this app called Data Color Picker by uh, Learn UI Design. It's this great tool where if you have a share graphic where there's a lot of colors, but you you want to stay within the family of colors that your your branding is in, um, it's a great way. You plug in the base color, and we're gonna have a link to this um, this all these uh, apps um, yeah, here shortly. I'm not sure if Carlos sent it already, but uh, you you click on here, throw one of your branding colors in, and it'll give you um, a ton of colors to pick from. That are in the same family, so you're not stuck to if your branding is two two uh, colors, you're able to kind of expand the palette uh, using this tool. It's it's really great. Um, and that free app is advocacy tool platforms. Uh, so for letter writing and petitions, you have Action Network and Change.org. Um, Action Network has free letter writing campaigns. Um, Change.org is great for petitions and has these both have free options. Um, for petitions and statements, um, you and surveying, uh, you have Google Forms, so that's a completely free option uh, that you can use. Um, and uh, awareness and messaging, again, using Google um, Google Docs, you can make social media toolkits for your users. This is a completely free way to uh, to kind of when we talked about uh, creating a path of these resistance. This is a great way where you can pre-write your social media. And someone can come in, copy and paste it, download the graphic, and post it on their um, on their own social media. Uh, and then awareness and messaging. Uh, I'm sorry, communication, Mailchimp, uh, free service uh, with a pretty generous number of emails that come for free. Um, it also has great um, segmenting tools to make sure you're reaching the right audience, uh, and also has some great um, plugins um, that work well with other 
um, low cost advocacy platforms such as uh, eCanvasser. And then user engagement, we love at CCC, we love to use to, we start using click to tweet. And it's a great tool where um, you can click on, um, you can free write a tweet, have a URL and, and a user can click on the, the URL and it will automatically populate in their, um, in their social media on, on their Twitter page and they can just press tweet and it will automatically tweet from their account. It's a really Robert, useful tool. Yes. We have a comment um, from Isabella yes. who said, we recently ran into an issue with click to tweet where our Outlook email server suddenly started making the CTT links as suspicious. Not sure if other folks have had a similar issue, but since then I've been wary of using them in our outreach, but loved them a lot prior to that. <laughs> so we actually, we don't use them in our emails. Um, so I can't speak to that, but we use them in our, uh, our take action pages um, where we'll have someone you know, a letter to, to write to uh, elected officials, and then we'll also have uh, tweets where someone can click and, and tweet. So I haven't run, run into that issue, but I'd be uh, curious to find out more about what would be causing that um, that issue. I know that Outlook just does tend to be very suspicious. Like I just got labeled a spammer and it took me two days to start being able to send emails again. So, I mean, it could just be something that you have to talk to your administrator about and they can fix it and create a rule where that doesn't happen. So I do also want to chime in here with this question too. Um, you know, if it ends up that that issue isn't being resolved in email, maybe that um, where um, emails are being marked suspicious, it could be an opportunity or a blessing in disguise. Um, because one of the things I think, and Robert can speak more to this too, is that um, we've started utilizing more of this engagement or our starting incorporating uh, engagement tools and mechanisms on our website directly in, or in that hub or that space where people go to the most. Um, because we want folks now that, you know, everyone's online more often to really start engaging uh, and not just, you know, reading something in an email, but going to that hub or centralized place and connect them to other activities or other things that people can do besides just that one action item that we want them to accomplish now. So I think, you know, if the email uh, issue does not, you know, is something that's a long-term thing that won't not readily get resolved, you can also explore other options of using click to tweets on your website, click to tweets on a Google doc or a blog, or even, you know, if you have a YouTube channel or other social uh, medium, um, media platforms that have links or a link tree with it, those can be uh, included in those spaces as well. Yeah, I mean, our, our mission, especially this year, was to make kind of make our take action pages one-stop shops for people to take action. Uh, in some cases, people to write a, their elected representatives, um, call their elected representatives, and tweet at them. Um, at their elected representatives. So we wanted to create a case environment where they had to come, they all had to do was come to one page and do all three in one place. Um, and we found click to tweet just to be a better option uh, for that. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to look more into that uh, as to why Alec was, was doing that. Um, I think we are ready for the next slide. Yeah, uh, another, this is continued. Um, uh, mobile phone photography. Um, Flagship phones are now great alternatives to DSLR and mirrorless cameras. If you don't have a professional camera on staff, um, or that you that uh, is shared on staff, um, especially for social media, uh, if you're not printing them out, like they take great photos, they now zoom in um, optically rather than um, digitally. So like you you can zoom in a little bit without uh, losing um, image quality. Um, so I, I would just, if you have those, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about photo effective photography um, in share graphics uh, down below. But um, I would say if you have if you have people on staff with flagship phones, or if you if you have a flagship phone just for the organization, stick with that. They take great photos for good enough photos for, for social media. Um, and then affordable stock photo repositories. This is something we've been leaning on all year long because we cannot we have not been in person and we have run out of. Uh, uh, City Hall rally photos. Um, so we've been going to, uh, we, we've been personally using, we pay the paid subscription for freepick.com, um, but they also have a free option with a bunch of free photos you can use. Um, there's also Pexel and Unsplash. All, they're all kind of the same. 
um, they're just, I don't know, they just, they just have free photos you can use. And if you want to pay for licenses for the photos, um, I think it's like seven bucks a month. So much more affordable than iStock and um, Adobe Photos. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I want to go over some case studies real quick um, and just go show some best practices and tips on how to increase engagement um, for your campaigns using um, those uh, the scroll stopping uh, share graphics and images I talked about. Um, so first I want to talk about the importance of cropping for the platform. Um, this is a this is not an example of a share graphic I would make, but I wanted to make something simple because I didn't want to use the actual uh, situation in which I saw this. Um, so we, we talked about the importance of these, um, uh, but another important step is to make sure that your users actually see them. So in this case, this was a image that was that was cropped for Instagram. So on the right hand side, you see it's more square and then posted on Twitter and Twitter automatically um, will crop in a little bit. You can click on that photo and it will show the whole thing. But when people are looking at their news feed, it's going to it's going to zoom in. Uh, like it is there. And as you can tell, look on the right, uh, if you compare the graphic on the right with the left, you've, the, you've completely changed your message um, between the two. Um, this is an actual case I saw, but even if you're not doing that, you're cutting off a part of the share graphic uh, from the user. So it's not gonna be as effective. You have this great photo you wanna use with it, these great graphics included in it, and then you're cutting it off. That's why I always encourage, earlier we were talking about time. What I usually, I typically do is I, will crop for Facebook and for Twitter. And then I will do a separate crop for Instagram, um, which is something we're gonna go out in my, go over in my breakout room. Um, but that just saves time uh, with Twitter. If, with, uh, if you use Facebook's um, dimensions and you bump in the sides, um, 75, uh, if you're using some kind of like Canva or some other tool, if you bump it in 75 pixels, that's gonna give you enough room on both sides so that you're not gonna lose anything on Twitter. Um, and then I crop for Instagram. I don't crop for all three anymore. It's just the time, like we, we, like I said, we're all small organizations. Um, it just saves a lot of time just to do the two. Okay. Uh, and also we have, uh, we will have a link um, uh, sharing the dimensions of all social media platforms, including their profiles, um, their profile images, their banner images, all that stuff that will be in the link. Uh, another case study here on the left. Um, so super simple, share graphic, high contrast. And it just says repeal 50A, right? And that's that we were talking about the, the grabbing someone's attention. So you're scrolling through, scrolling through, you, you see these large words, repeal 50A. You stop and then you, it makes you wanna read the smaller text on top, right? So when I was in journalism, we used this uh, technique called the inverted pyramid style. And think about that. You wanna put the most important information first and then gradually kind of back it up as you go. So. so with Twitter, you have your share graphic, which is going to be short and sweet. And then you have your copy that goes along with it. That is going to give probably a little bit more detail, right? But it's just a little bit more detail and a call to action. And then on your landing page, you can provide more detail before the person ultimately um, signs your petition or um, signs uh, becomes a, a, a email subscriber. And on the right hand side, uh, this was one of our share graphics where we used uh, for Twitter, we used e, um, an image, and then we had data we wanted to incorporate on this one. So we, we used bold, did you know, and then take action. So we, again, it's, it's draw them in with a photo and then draw their eyes towards the did you know, and then take action. So we want them to, to read the data and then take action. Okay, and next one. Okay, and this is the importance earlier, we talked about branding in Canva, this is why you wanna keep your branding consistent. Um, let's say you have supporters, right? And they're going through uh, just scrolling. Um, you wanna use consistent colors in your in your share graphics so that they know um, without even knowing or, or reading that you, you just shared something. So on the left-hand side, um, this is our, just a, a, a screenshot I took of our Instagram. Um, so you can see the consistent blues that we use throughout and the reds and the greens. Um, and then uh, we have our logo in every single um, one of these, um, whether it's in white or in uh, color. And on the right hand side, this is from Campaign for Children. Um, it's just a great high contrast share graphic with their colors. And like you immediately know if you're if you follow Campaign for Children, like you know who this is. Um, 
so just a couple examples. And next slide. Photography. Um, so this is just a couple of photos that I, that I took a few years ago at a, at a rally. Um, on the left hand side, I didn't zoom in. I didn't step forward. I just kind of took a photo of the crowd and no clear. There's really no clear subjects. There's a lot of back of the head. It doesn't really tell anything. It's not really. It's just a bunch of people and you don't really know what's going on. So the next photo, I stepped in through the crowd and snapped this photo of Councilman Traeger talking and that's just he that's the subject. Uh, it's much it's a much better photo. It tells a story. You can tell he's vigorously speaking about something and it's much more likely to to uh, get some engagement. And uh, lastly, um, advocating photos when you're using stock images. I just talked about we've been relying on these pretty heavily since um, because of social distancing. And um, talk yes. about this, there's a question about thoughts, preferences for stock photos versus photos of constituents. Uh, photos of constituents, always number one. Because stock photos, will, they, no matter what you do, stock photos will always look like stock photos. You know, um, photos of constituents are number one. That's the number one option. Um, our, with our organization, it's a bit challenging because we are a step away from, we're not a direct service provider. So a lot of times our photos are of rallies um, and whatnot. So we have to, we, we were a bit more reliant on stock photos than uh, say a direct service provider. But I will always rely, I would always rely on, you know, working with a client, uh, I'm sorry, working with our constituents, um, uh, seeing if they'll let you into their home with a photographer, take photos of them in their daily lives or whatever messaging you're trying to portray. Um, and uh, um, more often than not, they'll be super willing to do that for you because they know you, they trust you and they want to help you out. Um, and also like a lot of times, some of the organizations I've done photos in the past will offer them free, the free photos. Um, uh, that they'll be able to like, you know, print or hang up or share on social media. So stock photos. Uh, do we have a question? No. Okay. Uh, make sure stock photos um, are representative. So that means that they are diverse, but also you want to avoid stereotypes. Um, and then use photos that are related to the uh, subject. So on the right hand side, this is a great one that we used for a, a youth survey that was done over text. Um, that, so again, it's related to what we were trying to get people to do. And I, I believe that's the actual phone number that, for the survey. So somebody, somebody did some Photoshopping and did that um, for us. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna hand things over to Laura who's going to cover um, how to take these tools and, and use them for engaging legislators and community members. And you muted. Such a rookie move. Um, hi again, uh, my name is Laura Jangstrom and I am the Director of Civic Engagement Programs at CCC. Um, and I'm gonna explore with you today the various ways to involve legislators and community members in your advocacy campaigns. Um, so in many ways, the how to involve part starts long before we get to the action or advocacy piece of your campaign. Um, so, you know, effective advocacy campaigns begin in communities where problems are defined and researched, um, where solutions are explored, and where recommendations are created by and with those who are most impacted by the systems at play. So by the time we get to the action phase, that, which is what we're really talking about today, there should already be a base. I mean, how big that is depends on the campaign, but a base of support among the community. And at this point, what we're really talking about are tactics to broaden your reach outside of the immediate community that's already sort of been involved in this campaign from the beginning. So we'll start with how to engage uh, legislators who have the ability to vote on the bills and budgets that will lead to the policy changes you're seeking. So once you have a plan in place for getting a seat at the table, you can hit the gas on promoting your campaign to gain public support. And so hopefully that public support translates into political support. Um, and you can also craft an engaging action plan with those dedicated community members who are ready for action, right? These actions can channel the energy and momentum you've already built up into maximizing your digital footprint. Um, and we'll talk more about this throughout my, my portion here. But again, the goal is increasing public and political awareness and engagement. You know, public will often equals political will. Um, and so they're very interrelated. 
Um, so to restate, by the time you're ready to engage legislators, you already know what you want to say. Now, the first thing you need to do is package and deliver the information you'd like to com convey and the recommendations you'd like to put forward, which a lot of us refer to as our platform or our priorities, right? So in the digital sphere, you really need to be able to convey even dense data and policy rich materials in graphic and succinct products. So on the side of this slide, you see a sample page of our latest budget priorities. This is one of two pages. So you can see that even though it is text heavy, it's designed to be colorful, graphic, intentionally laid out with headings and a pop out box. So the balance here is to be able to edit your platform down without losing the essential information. You can consider linking out from the document again, preferably to that central hub, whether it's your website or your advocacy platform um, or attaching additional documents depending on, you know, um, how you're getting this into the hands of legislators, but a one to two page document is much more likely to be read in its entirety than a lengthy one. Um, so this is the product that you will bring to every Zoom meeting with legislators, what you will link to on social media, what you will reference during rallies, like this is your message, your leave behind and what your community of advocates must remain focused on throughout your campaign. Next slide. Um, so once you have your materials ready, you have to figure out how to get it into the hands of the people who should have your information, right? So that is people in decision-making positions or those who are able to influence people with decision-making power. Um, so fortunately, because I am not the most tech savvy person, but I've learned it and I've done it, um, the strategies, the engagement strategies that we're using are not that different than the strategies we use in person. It's just that the actions have now migrated over into the digital space. So we still schedule meetings with city council members, other legislators um, to educate them about our issues and advocate for our positions. Now they're held by teleconference instead of in the legislator's office um, using Zoom or some other platform, but they still usually last about 30 minutes. Um, and just like in real life, you wanna have supporters there with you, not just you know, the, the staff um, who are talking all the jargon, right? You wanna have your supporters in your community there with you to share their stories, um, you know, whether they're service providers or like Im impacted folks. You probably also don't wanna have a group larger than 10 people in a given meeting, whether in person or on Zoom. Um, it's just, it just becomes distracting, um, but this is really like, these meetings are an opportunity to go in depth and answer questions about your issue. Um, another strategy that we use both in person and in the digital space are rallies or press conferences. So there was a learning curve with this. Um, I think people are still kind of trying out different ways, but you know, advocates have tried over the last year a lot of different ways of doing virtual rallies. I don't think there's any one right way. We have found that having only the speakers and tech support in the actual Zoom and then live streaming the rally on another platform makes it easier to manage the flow and distractions on the Zoom itself. Um, so you can live stream on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or even your website if you have somebody who's like um, managing your website in-house. Um, the downside is that not everyone has these social media platforms. So you may have access issues for people who want to tune in but don't say, have Facebook if you're if you're streaming on Facebook. That's why we figured out how to do it on our website. Um, and you can, I, we don't have time to stop, but I do have a question about if anyone's had success doing this in another way. Um, and then of course we can't talk about digital advocacy strategies without talking about social media plat, uh, actions. So there's so many things you can do. I just listed a few here, Twitter storms, tweet chats, Instagram stories, Instagram lives, Facebook lives. Um, right, there's a lot of stuff you can do on social media. I started just, I just started calling Twitter storms, Twitter rallies, because I liked the way it sounded. And I don't think that's a real word, but I'm sticking with it. I like Twitter rallies. Um, all right, next slide. So you can also do digital letter writing campaigns. We've talked about this throughout this workshop. Um, is there a question? Sorry. No, that's just noise outside. Um, so we use Salsa for our letter writing campaigns, but 
Robert mentioned others such as change.org and action network that have kind of the same function. So to the right is an image of what about what one of our e actions look like. Um, so basically you just populate it with your information and it will, depending on your address, automatically send it to your representatives, plus the targets that we've pre-identified that should receive um, this communication. Um, if you don't have the capacity or the desire to use an online platform, you can do an old fashioned email campaign where you just provide your community members and your listserv of advocates with the text of an email and a list of email addresses of your targets. Um, it's very DIY and low tech. Um, but if you are going that route, you can make sure that you use your connections or any online sleuth skills that you have to see if you can find an email other than the generic email address or like contact form that they have online. Um, so you're looking for like chief of staff, legislative director, budget director, constituent liaison, right? Like you do also want to send it to the to the general address, but it always helps if you see seeing someone a little more targeted. So on the list of um, <clears throat> uh links that carlos sent around earlier there is a website that can help you do some of that sleuthing called billtrack.com so i would check that out um just a couple more things here so this i think is what the folks in the room are probably i'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this here we, we're going to go into it during my breakout session but you know engaging the community you know we're advocates we're organizers like that's what we do we all know how to do this it's the same as it's always been right maybe we're just pumping up you know, the design or, um, you know, just how we do this or, or, or the amount of this that we do, right? Um, so you're creating your promotional materials, which is, Robert did a very good job talking about social media graphics. Here's an example of a flyer. Um, you want to also like, you know, if you want 100 people to take action, you need to get the take action in front of at least 1,000 people, right? There's this 10% rule that 10% of people who see your materials are actually going to engage with them. So who is your audience? Who's going to be interested in hearing this information? And what are the creative ways that you can compile contacts, right? Um, so in addition to just compiling your your contacts and sending things via email, Carlos, next slide, um, we're also obviously promoting on um, social media. Um, and there's also now like text messaging platforms that people are really into. So that's WhatsApp. You can just use basic SMS. Um, we use a platform called Community Connect Labs, um, where it allows us to send like mass communications to people. Um, you know, that is for a fee, but you can use these other free apps to do sort of text messaging mobilization. Um, okay, next slide. Um, ad in addition to promotion, right? So you did your email, you did your own social media stuff, but also, you know, ask your partners to spread the word, make it easy. So the, e the email that you forward to your partners, they should be able to just click forward and send it to whomever they want without even writing anything except for, hey, check this out from our partners, right? It should be easy for them to forward and then the person on the receiving end, even if they have no idea who we, we are, gets the message, right? And it's appealing to them as well. Um, and also, if you want your partners to spread the word on social media, share sample posts, right? Like say, hey, can you just tweet this? And so it's easy for them to copy and paste um, instead of, you know, trying to give them all the information that they need to create their own kind of posts. They could want to and have every intention in the world, but I know if somebody sends me something to share and I can copy and paste it, I'm much more likely to do it in that minute and it won't fall behind, right? So just make it easy for people. And you can also share toolkits, which we'll go into more in my breakout. Um, and then also cross promote. So bring the information about your campaigns um, to meetings and events when appropriate, you know, build good karma. So be generous in promoting the work of others and also partner with others. If you have five people on a campaign, that's five listservs, right? That's five times the amount of engagement that you can get if you're just, than if you're just trying to do a campaign on your own. You have to know how to play nice in the sandbox, but I'm sure you all do. Um, and my final slide um, is just about equitable participation and engagement. Um, Robert touched on this a little bit. So where you can have materials in multiple languages, use closed captions. Um, I don't know why it's not happening now, maybe because I'm not, but I think Zoom has started to automatically close caption things. Like I think you can, if you have the latest update, it will automatically close caption your 
um, what you're saying. I did this yesterday on Zoom and I started speaking and it was closed captions just automatically as I was speaking. We should be doing that right now. <laughs> um, also, you know, lean on partners for capacity issues. If you don't have the capacity to translate something and you have a partner who does like, you know, reach out, maybe they'll help you. Um, I think Carlos had a couple of pieces as our community engagement specialist that he wanted to add um, to this slide. Um, and then we can take questions. Thank you, Laura. I think because of time, we kind of want to go into the breakout group so that way um, folks can kind of workshop their questions as well as go into the content that you have um, for those sessions. Um, so if you do have questions on what we shared or um, on the some of the challenges that you raised at the beginning of this conversation, um, bring them up in the breakout group so that way um, the facilitator and even if uh, folks in the rooms have uh, ideas or suggestions can provide it there. Um, so we're going to be, um, you'll see a di dialogue box 